Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part time musician who wants to go full time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. On the Profitable Musician Show, we give you practical tips and strategies to increase the income you're already making and tap into new streams so you can create more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. We also help you think like a business owner so you can keep more of the money that you make. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, author of the best-selling book, The Musician's Profit Path, and host of the popular Profitable Musician Summit. And as you can probably tell, I am obsessed with helping musicians like you to build a rock-solid fan base and income foundation so you can fund the music you are driven to create, share your message with the world, and fulfill your God-given purpose as a musician without stressing out about where your next dollar is going to come from. You've got the talent. You just need the marketing and business tools to take it to the next level. Now let's dive in to the Profitable Musician Show. Welcome, everyone. This is Bree Noble, and I am so excited to be here with my friend Fiona Flight. I've had her on the podcast before, but I really wanted her to come on and talk about YouTube because she's been very intentional about growing her YouTube. And I get questions from musicians all the time How can I get more views on my YouTube? I've been struggling to grow my YouTube. So I'm, I'm like, seriously excited to ask her questions about this because I really want to know the answers as well. So um, before we get into YouTube, though, I want her to give a little bit of background on, you know, what is her musical background? What has she done up to this point? And why does she love focusing on YouTube? So (laughs) uh, my background is in classical music. I was a classically trained opera singer and I sang opera and musical theater, which was my, and is my first love musical theater. And along the way, I discovered that it was challenging to support myself fully, uh, just on opera, opera alone or musical theater performing alone. And at that time I started teaching voice along the way, further along the way, I realized that teaching voice wasn't really lighting me up. And I was still frustrated watching all of my incredible singing students have the same kind of challenges with making money that I had had as a performer. And that was really the genesis for my pivoting in my business and becoming a business coach for performing artists, because my mission is very much to help other performing artists ditch the starving artist mindset and actually become profitable because it it is completely possible as you know, and as you coach as well. And it's just a huge passion for me to do that. And then I think you asked, you know, why YouTube specifically? And what happened for me is that I have never let go of my performing. I still consider myself absolutely a singer and actor and performer. That is my, uh, one of my passions. And so YouTube is this perfect vehicle for musicians to get their music out there, but it's also a great vehicle for coaches. And as far as I'm concerned with so many musicians being, you know, music musicians slash teachers or singers slash teachers slash coaches, YouTube is such a great platform for all of us to build a sort of street, a, a seamless system for bringing people into both parts of our businesses. Yeah, that's really smart. And I know when you told me you were doing that, you were kind of alternating between doing like performance videos and then maybe some teaching videos. And I thought that that was really smart because especially with the teaching ones, it's easier to take advantage of SEO, which is huge on YouTube, right? Because it is a Google property. And so let's just talk a little bit about 
I know that you have a whole course on YouTube. And so you know all about, you know, the benefits of SEO. How, how can we really take advantage of titles that people are looking for? And is there any way to do this with our music stuff? Or is that why we need the other stuff so we can really utilize the SEO? So you can absolutely utilize the SEO for both. You, there's no reason you can't blow up uh, the SEO. You can't. You can totally go viral using SEO to drive your music videos. This is not a problem, but it is. It's a. It can be a little bit more challenging to figure out what those SEO words are, and you need to have a pretty, pretty strong strategy when it comes to covers when you are wanting to really benefit from that SEO functionality as a musician. I wanna point out just uh, like you were saying, Google is owns YouTube and YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. So Google is the first largest and YouTube is actually the second largest. Yeah. Oh, I know. And I'm always trying to figure out, I mean, that's one reason I've got this strategy now of putting the podcast on YouTube. I want to be able to take advantage of search because with podcasts, it's not so easy. It doesn't, they're trying to work it in, but it's, it's just not coming along like, you know, YouTube is. So um, with the covers, like, how does that, how, I'm curious how that works for classical artists. Does that tend to work just as well for, you know, people that are doing, say, classical or musical theater versus, you know, singing the new hit song by Olivia Rodrigo or Taylor Swift or something like that? Yeah, honestly, it does work for both, but you have to think outside of the box and you need to get creative. So, for example, you want to be analyzing your own metrics. So you go back in and you see which of your videos are performing the best. One of the things that I, I saw in my own, uh, in the back end of my own metrics was that a, a song called Come Ready and See Me by Richard Hundley, it's an American art song, was doing really, really well. And I deduced from that that a lot of singers in conservatories, younger singers, it's a, it are, were looking for that song. So it's a really popular song for, for singers, young singers and conservatories to do on their recitals and their juries because we have this American art song requirement, mm. but it's not a song that has been recorded a whole lot. Maybe at this point it's been recorded more, but it's certainly when I was in school, nobody had, there was, there was no access to recordings of it to listen to. And so it was very interesting to me that that was one of the songs that was doing really well, you know, not a new song, not a well-known, not at all a well-known song, but a beautiful song that was really popular in a very specific segment of the population that was my ideal audience. So that's an example of using this for, as a, you know, using it as a classical singer. Another one that has done really well is Caro Mio Ben. This I was going like, to, I was going to say that because that is like the song, you know, when you're, when you're in school and you have to sing in recital, it's like the first song you do. Exactly. <laughs> it's the first song everybody does. So everybody is searching for it. And there's not a whole lot of professional singers doing it, right? We have that incredible Say to Mommy CD by Cecilia Bartoli, but on YouTube, you're not going to find a whole bunch of different versions of professionals doing it. You're going to find a lot of younger, newer singers putting it up on YouTube. So again, this is like being strategic and thoughtful and creative about what would people be searching that who, who I want to find my channel. So I love that because you're thinking, okay, these are the people that I actually want to attract because you have a program that, you know, helps people become profitable performers, right? Is there any point where it makes sense to attract people for attraction's sake and not because they're your perfect customer, just because you really want to get your watch hours up or you want to, you know, increase your subscribers or something, or is it always we need to attract our perfect customer with our videos? I mean, this is a great question. We're always wanting to grow our reach. We're always wanting to bring in new people, bringing in somebody who's maybe not our ideal customer. Uh, they may share our video to people who are, are, are our ideal customer. 
but the the question there is are they are are they our ideal follower like everybody doesn't have to be a customer at the point when they find us right they could just be part of our cheerleading section they could be part of our audience part of our community and so from my standpoint we're always wanting to draw in the people who are if not ideal customers they're ideal community members mm. I like and that. so, and this is, there's a great example of this on my channel now, unfortunately, <laughs> I was really thinking about, okay, what are people searching? Because this is what we want to figure out. We want to, we, we want to get into the brains of people. What, what are the trending topics? What are people searching that I could create a video on? And at one point I was uh, brought in to be a a brand ambassador for a new app called Firework. It's a, it's a short form video platform. And when I was invited to participate in this program, it was a, they were gonna pay me to create videos. I didn't know if it was legit or a scam. And so I went to YouTube to find out and to Google and I'm searching is Firework a legit or a scam? And I couldn't find any information. And I thought, oh, bingo, this is a topic that I should create a video around because there, there's, you know, this is something I want to know, I'm searching for, and there's no answer. So once I got into the program and I started to, you know, figure out what it was all about, I created a video on that subject and I did all the, the back end SEO for it. And it's my most, high, it's my highest performing video. Now, here's the problem. People who watch that are not interested in my services as a business coach. They're not interested in my music and they're not interested in my other videos. Yeah. That, not I mean, good. <laughs> it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a problem. So if that happens to you, do you keep it there just because it still increases your watch hours or do you delete it? So first what I did was I created more videos on firework <laughs> because I was wanting to do what you're supposed to do, which is look at your metrics, see what is performing the best, and then create more videos in that, you know, on that topic that for those people, and those are amongst my next best performing videos. <laughs> Uh, but as time passed and I saw the degree to which they kept, you know, rolling and bringing in more followers, I really could see that it, it was not an effective strategy. Now, mm -hmm. did I want to delete them or keep them? I haven't decided, honestly. Right now, they're still there and they still bring in people and I still get comments on them that are no longer relevant since I'm no longer with that company. At this time, I can't really answer their questions because that, that company has changed a lot since I was with them. It's, it's a really good question. And I'm kind of, for the time being, as I work to, towards those initial watch hours, which I don't have yet, I, I'm just leaving it. And I think that at the point when I when I accrue all, enough watch hours, perhaps at that point, I'll delete them. But I'm also very much in favor of, P, of, of allowing our audience and our biggest fans to see our progress. Mm -hmm. So leaving it there means that the people who listen to this podcast can go see it and go, oh, this is what she was talking about. This is a don't do. <laughs> Yeah. And it's cool. I mean, people that take your course, you can, you can use that as an example. Hey, go to my YouTube channel right now. See, see the problem that this caused, you know, you don't want to go down this route. Like you're taking this course so you can, uh, you know, cut the learning curve. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So my guess is that I'll probably leave them up for mostly that reason that I just, I really like to honor the progression and I like to let that be visible. Yeah, I have a few like that too, that are like, you know, when I was really, really unclear on what I was focused on, you know, in, in business or how I was going to use my channel, there's some on there that still do really well. And I'm like, I don't really want to be known for this, but <laughs> right, right, it's there, it's fine, you know, or, you know, the times that I was putting my podcast up there, that it's just the static 
picture and not the actual video. And I remember asking you, I'm like, should I take those down? Because there is one or two that do really well still. So my I mean, answer is leave them. Especially yeah, I know you well. told me that. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know, you know, but yeah, I mean, people really don't go diving back into the archives of your channel to be like, oh my gosh, what were you thinking? You know? No, the people that go into the archive are the fans. Yes. They're the ones that are like really excited to see your Genesis, to enjoy your early content. And they don't even, a lot of the time, even notice that it's by our standards inferior to what we're putting out now, because the content really, it's still you, the core of you there and they're fans and they're excited for it. So that's, yeah, that's where I'm at with that. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so let's approach this from somebody who doesn't have anything on YouTube yet. Maybe they're in my, you know, academy and they see that in the foundation stage, it's like, you need to set up your YouTube channel. What are they, how do they get started? Like, what do they do first? What's the easiest way to actually get some content on there? Okay, well, the very first thing that I would encourage them to do is get realistic about what they can do consistently. So it's really important to your new audience that you let them know, hey, I'm going to be here once a week, or hey, I'm going to be here once a month. But it's a specific day. Uh, and as if you want to get crazy, it can be a specific time as well. But it's, it's very much a specific day that you're going to post every week or, or every month, whatever it is. So you decide, okay, this is realistic for me and I'm going to commit to it. For people who are just starting out on YouTube, I really encourage you to make a commitment to yourself or to a small group of people that will hold you accountable because YouTube is not easy. It's just not, it, it requires a, a significant amount of effort. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta film a video uh, over time. You're going to want to be improving your audio, your visual uh, and, and your technology in general, your editing skills, your, uh, your equipment. So you've got all of the equipment pieces, you've got to film it, you've got to edit it, you've got to deal with your audio, then you've got to promote it, you've got to get generate your ideas, you've got to um, engage with other people on YouTube to help your channel grow. It's just, it's just, there's a lot, lot, lot of elements that go into it. And I see a lot of people quit. And so what I would say in the beginning is definitely decide Literally, what is realistic for me? And don't overshoot it. Maybe it's just one video a month, but you could feel really good that you actually did it every month. And then what I did in the very beginning was I reached out to a small group of people that were like truly friends and family who I knew supported me. And I said, I'm adding you to a, an email list. I am going to, you know, if, if you say yes, I, I gave them a, some of them, I said, you could say no. <laughs> Some of them, like my mom and my brother, I was like, you're on my email list. I'm going to be emailing you every time I put out a new video. And I really need you to head on over to YouTube, watch it, like it, and give me a comment. <laughs> totally. Because that I needed that kind of support at the beginning. So I get everybody doesn't have you know, a, a core group of people to do that for them, but hopefully you have at least one person that you could, you, you know, bring onto this little cheerleading squad and, and support this early effort because it's a big deal. It really is a big deal to put yourself out on YouTube and commit to it. It is. It definitely is. And I mean, you know, if you're, if you're in somewhere like the Academy or you have another group of musicians that, you know, and you all want to commit to it, right. You can, help each other out. That's the best way to do it for sure. Yeah, exactly. You know, then you kind of got your little accountability group and you've also got your little promotional squad and, you know, all boats rise with the tide. That's always, I swear I say that like once an episode when I'm on here, because it's so important to me. It's one of my main values. Um, but I know last night on clubhouse, we were talking about this and you were talking about, you know, being realistic being consistent, but also being realistic. And you were talking about how you started out doing like, like biting off way too much more than you could chew. 
I did. I did. I absolutely did. So when I started on YouTube, I was producing two videos a week and understand that I had never produced videos before. So that was a lot. And the reason that I did it was because I knew that if I was producing the coaching content, but not the music, not the, not my music, that there was a good chance that I would let the music go because I just, I just saw that that was a danger. And I did not, I just did not want that to happen. I wanted the, I wanted to model for my audience that you can have, have this, this diversified income where your coaching or your teaching business actually brings in eyes to your music business and vice versa, that the two are feeding each other and that as a personal brand, you can absolutely create something very synergistic. And so I, I really wanted to model this. I wanted to be an inspiration for some of my teacher or coach or coaching followers who were still really also wanting to create music or for the musicians who wanted more, another stream of income, but were afraid that if they started teaching, it meant they weren't real performers anymore, which was something that I had carried in, in my own subconscious. So I, I did, I committed to two videos a week, which meant eight videos a month. And, and it was a lot. And I, I carried my commitment to myself and to that small group of people were, was for a full year. But my husband was like, really, you know, a year. And I was like, yes, you don't understand. I have to make it a year or I might quit. Well, about five months in, my business started to grow in other areas. I started to get more clients. I started to develop my, my group program. And at that point, I had to ask myself, what is YouTube for? <laughs> Why am I on YouTube? Am I on YouTube as, as some kind of personal you know, quest? Or am I on YouTube as, as a you know, distribution channel for my business? And I decided that it was really the latter. And so at that point, I thought, okay, I still want to be consistent, but I also need more time for these, these other areas of my growing business. So how about if I cut it to one video a week, which is still a lot, right? And I'll still go back and forth between coaching and music videos. So I did that for a while. And then I, I realized, you know, I hit other stages in my business where I, I thought, okay, I just need to be flexible and I need to, I need to, it's not a some kind of strike against me if I decide to take a break from YouTube in order to focus on something else. And then I bring it back again when the time is right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love <laughs> it's, it's funny because, you know, you got the results that you wanted, right? You like, you did the YouTube, you kicked its butt for a while. And then you're like, oh my gosh, my business is growing so much probably because of all this work I put on in YouTube. So then we might tend to be like, but I can't stop because then I'll stop doing, you know, getting my business like I was if I pull back and yeah. I'm, you know, it, credit to you that you didn't like give into that fear or I know, you know, it's, it's really easy to think that like, well, if I just, if I pull back, then I'll have less business. And, but on the other hand, you can't possibly handle it because you've got, you know, this commitment plus all this business that you got. Right. Right. And it's, and it's not even just the, it's, it also is like a mental thing. I, I wasn't so much, there was some fear, but it wasn't so much fear that I would lose the audience or lose, lose the income it was more or the eyeballs it was it was more about something silly inside myself about <laughs> commitments like i made this commitment and therefore the commitment stands above all else and that was the thing i really had to look at like who did i make the commitment to and for right Yep. Yeah. I mean, you and I are cut from the same cloth on that one. Cause I had the same thing with my podcast and one, you know, at one point I did take almost an entire year break from my podcast. Cause I needed to, you know, I, I was burning out and yeah. now I'm just like so excited to do my podcast every week because I haven't been grinding for six years. You know, I took the break when I needed it. So I think that's, it's a hard balance between consistency and, and giving yourself some grace. And like, I'm going to be honest, most of the time musicians problem is consistency, 
Mm-hmm. Right. So I'm not letting any of you guys off the hook because if you haven't done it for a year, you don't, you, you can't take a break because you haven't developed consistency. So I'm going to kick your butt there on the consistency side. Um, everyone that's listening who hasn't, who wants to start a YouTube channel and hasn't done it yet. Um, I, I agree. So let's go back <laughs> to that first thing. Why did yeah. I make a commitment in the first place? was because without that commitment, I wouldn't have been consistent. And the very first tip was you need to be consistent, but you need to be realistic about what consistent means to you. Yes, yes, so that's, that's perfect. So, you know, one of the major points of being consistent is obviously to build your subscriber base, to, you know, build up your body of work so more people will find it. And one of those metrics that is so hard to reach is watch hours. Do you have any, any ideas on how we can get more watch hours? Because that has been my biggest struggle. Yeah, I mean, let's back up for a second. So people want, in order to monetize, because people don't understand this, or especially new people new to YouTube, in order to monetize your YouTube channel, which means to allow uh, YouTube to run ads that you would be paid for, you need a thousand subscribers and you need 4,000 watch hours. And a lot of people will hit that 1,000 subscriber mark, but not have the watch hours, which is the situation you're in, is if yeah. I'm... Yes, absolutely. And, and so this, this is a really important thing for people to understand as they are hopping on YouTube, hoping that it's going to be another like amazing income stream. YouTube can be an amazing in- income stream, but for very, very few people, is that income stream going to be the ad revenue as like the big driver? So I would kind of first ask, why is this 4,000 watch hours so important to someone? And if they're saying, well, I just want to get that ad revenue, then I say, okay, that's great. It's, It's great to have another stream of income, but what are your expectations for how much ad revenue you're going to be getting? And is it really going to make such a big impact on your business? Or, and, and also, is there some kind of like popularity thing going on in your head, some kind of vanity metrics thing where it's like, well, I just need to be monetized. I just need that 4,000 watch hours. And again, it's kind of like, but why? Like what's actually going on underneath? Because at the point when you start getting the, the ad revenue, hopefully you already have much stronger revenue streams in other areas of your business. And when we look at the people who are the most successful on YouTube, they're not making the majority of their money from the ad revenue. They're making it from their merch. They're making it from their course, whatever they're funneling people from YouTube to. So none of that changes. The ad revenue is just a little icing on the cake. Yeah, you are so absolutely right. And I don't need the ad revenue. I mean, I don't need it, but it's just, it becomes that, that like white whale thing. Right. You know, and I'm not sure why I think it's just because I want to feel like, you know, I'm putting in the effort and I want to be at least like acknowledged or rewarded for it that I'm like, you know, putting on my makeup or, you know, doing my hair, you know, I used to do my podcast just audio. And because it was so much easier, you know, and, and now I've, I've set up a batch system. And so it's, it's a, it's a lot easier to do the videos, but I was so resistant to it. So I think that's probably why, because I was so resistant to it before. And I'm like, Oh, I just don't want to do that. I don't want to go through all that trouble. And now I am doing that. And I do have somebody that's producing the videos for me and, you know, at least minimally. um, So I don't have to do it. And so I'm like, well, I am investing that and I'm investing, you know, a little extra time and effort and all that stuff. And I just feel like I just want someone to reward me for that. <laughs> well, here's, I, I want to head over to YouTube for a second, just to look at your, <laughs> to, to look at your funnel, what you've got going on over on YouTube. Yeah, well, and that's the thing, right? I probably don't, because I have only been doing this for a few months, I don't really have a good funnel situation going on over there. What is it under? If I look up Brie Noble? Uh, it'll just be Brie Noble, yeah. Okay, awesome. So if I, if I just look at your... 
Okay, no. So I'm looking at I'm looking at Bree's YouTube channel, and the very first sentence of her, her description is for our free resource, 19 proven sources of income you probably haven't considered for your music business, go to, then we have a link to femmusician.com. That is where your income is coming from. Right. So it's far more important that you get the, the handful, the, hun, you know, the hundreds versus the thousands of watches of people who are your ideal clients who are going to hit that link and get added to your email list and join your community. That, that is the point and you're doing it. Okay. Well, I love that. Thank you for the mini coaching moment. <laughs> But I mean, that is true. Okay. So I do have that, but I feel like that is the point. Yes, that is the point. Okay. <laughs> I'm over the watch hours. Well, okay. I'm going to admit I'm not over it, but we'll, we'll talk about the watch hours again for, for a moment, what you can do to increase the watch hours. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my, my point is that in terms of the, the income stream, we really want to be doing what Brie is in fact doing, which is funneling people who find us via search on YouTube to our world. We want to bring them into our world. So the next thing that we absolutely want to have at the top of our description, just like Brie has, is some kind of way, some kind of entry to our world, to our mailing list. So if you are a musician, you want to have some kind of what they call a lead magnet. Maybe it's your MP3, a free song download, your lyrics, your, your book of poetry, whatever it is that you Exclusive give away. video, yeah, something like that, right? To, to get people onto your email list to become subscribers into your world. And so that's, <laughs> that, this, is, this is the primary way that I believe most everybody makes actual money on YouTube. It's not via the ad revenue, it's via our other services. YouTube is a primarily a distribution platform, just like podcasts. And so we want to distribute our content on YouTube in order to bring the people into our world, help them find us, and then help, us, help them to want to dive deeper into our different offerings. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. The, the watch hours. So... There are a lot of strategies for how to, how to increase your watch hours. And I'm afraid that there isn't really a quick, there, no, there is no quick fix. There is no workaround. There is no, <laughs> there's no magic bullet or magic genie. What it takes is <laughs> improving our videos. <laughs> <laughs> the better we make our videos, the longer people will watch them. And so there's a challenge with something like a podcast because there isn't that visual element. I remember we talked earlier, now that you're doing, you're actually recording the podcast as videos, this is great. That's a first step, but there are other elements that you can add in your editing to make, the, to make it pop more, to make it more visually compelling, to make people want to stick around, et cetera. Another thing that you want to do is, really uh, analyze the videos that are doing the best. And it's probably similar with your podcast. You look at, okay, which videos are getting the most watch time? Which videos are the ones that people are really interested in? And then you wanna create more podcasts or videos on, this, on similar or related topics that the people who found those were in, like, why did they watch it? What was it about that? video that made them watch longer and then recreating. So there's a little bit of uh, reverse engineering that needs to happen. And again, it's like, how compelling can we make the videos? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I mean, and that would require extra work and, and, <laughs> and all that, right? So, you know, investment. And so I have to decide as all of you have to decide is that where you want to invest your time and, and money and, you know, get an editor and all that. If you really want to make a play on YouTube, that's probably what you have to do, right? You can't just put up videos of you playing in your living room. You need to make them more interesting, right? Right, right. And I mean, so, so again, it depends. And you could generally poor production values on YouTube do not play. So you could be doing it in your living room 
and your living room could have a dirty old couch that is like falling apart and your camera is not very good and you have poor lighting. Okay. That's not going to do well. You could also do a video in your living room with a really, you know, beautifully painted wall, you know, just a, a plain color, but it's really, it pops and it's pretty. And your microphone looks kind of cool on camera and you do your makeup and you, you know, you, you dress to the part or whatever it is that you're trying to get across. You've got some good lights and you've got a nice camera and good audio then it's fine to do it in your interview, in your living room. But the production value itself does matter. And then if we're talking about growing, you really want to look at what people like Lindsey Sterling and um, I love, and Peter Hollins and Whitney Avalon. These are some people, if you're not familiar with them, look them up on YouTube. They're all musicians and or singers who are, I mean, singers are musicians. Yeah. <laughs> Just just an aside, <laughs> just had to catch myself on that. <laughs> uh, but their production values are like, whoa, <laughs> you see what, what becomes possible once you really start putting yourself, you know, giving yourself that creative task of how can I, how can I make incredible videos as a musician? Check out those because whew, love them. Awesome. That's, that's some great advice and some great people to check out for sure. Love Lindsay Sterling. Uh, I did want to say like when you were talking about look at your metrics, see what's working. One thing that I really notice that works is when I collab on a podcast episode with someone who's already doing it on YouTube, like really trying to grow their YouTube channel. They have a YouTube presence. They have people that traditionally comment on their YouTube videos. So one of our best videos, our guest is somebody that clearly is paying attention to their YouTube. They're cultivating their community there. So how would you recommend that artists use that concept to, you know, do some collabs on their channel? Well, I, I think that's, that's it. Do collabs on your channel. <laughs> 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 what kind of collabs would, you know, would be cool? I mean, do you think they should perform together? Should they bring someone on as like a take a takeover video? You know, it's, it's very interesting when it comes to collabs because you have to decide whose channel is it going to live on? Is it going to be on one person's channel or the other person's channel or both channels? And the problem with putting it on both channels is that it dilutes its range, mm -hmm. right? So we, we, want, we want a video to go viral. And if we have two videos that we're trying to get to go viral then, and they're the same video, right? That just dilutes the possibility. So if you are, it, so when you think about who you wanna collab with, it's kind of the same as any collab, right? You want that person to be generous. You want that person to be someone that you know, let's say, let's say the, the video is your idea, it's gonna live on your channel. And let's say you reach out to somebody with 100,000 followers who happens to be your friend and, and they or subscribers and they say, yes, they're going to do it. They're your friend, but they're kind of your frenemy and they're not, they don't shout you out at all to their 100,000 people. So did it really matter that you, you know, because it didn't, it wasn't living on their channel. So it didn't get sent out to their subscribers and they never shouted you out. Whereas let's say you, you have met someone else with just 5,000 subscribers who is really collaborative and really open to that kind of exchange and, and is super engaged with their smaller audience and just shouts you and the video out like crazy. That's the kind of person that you want to collab with. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And that's a really good point. And I've found that to be true with, any collabs I've done as well. Like it doesn't matter how well known they are. It's more about what, if they have a medium sized audience and they're willing to, you know, they're excited to be collabing with you and they want to tell people about it. Well, they've got an audience. It might not be as big as someone else that you had targeted, but they're getting all of their audience to see you. Whereas the other person may get none of their audience to see you. Right. Yeah, exactly. And then again, we go back to our, our funnel, right? We want to bring people into our world. So it, it's far better to have that medium-sized audience coming your way of people who are really engaged and interested. And then some of those people actually go, 
gosh, I want to stick around. I want to be part of your community too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's see, is there anything, I mean, we've covered so much. Is there anything else that we haven't covered best practices, do's and don'ts of YouTube? There is, there is so much, there is a lot more. Well, there's probably a ton, right? So, <laughs> right. There's only so much time. Yes. Um, but uh, let's see what, what, let's talk about your banner because a lot of the times people don't maximize that banner space. Your channel banner is the first impression. You want that first impression to be good. You don't want to just throw up some, some like uh, not visual, you know, and also YouTube is such a visual medium. So you just throw up some random background picture. No. And put up a little bit of text, no. You wanna be very strategic with that banner and remember that as you're creating it, the dimensions are weird. <laughs> they are weird. So it looks like a different, plat whether it's on the desktop, you have a longer amount of space and it keeps shrinking based on whether you're looking at it on a tablet or mobile. And so what looks great on desktop might look really bad on mobile. So you wanna actually, you. Uh, you want to search on YouTube for a video teaching you how to make a good, <laughs> a good cover because they're, they, they're out there and they have templates for it. And then make sure that in that center of your cover is ex your channel banner is exactly what you most want them to see. And that should be something that gives them a great idea of why they should subscribe to your channel. What kind of music do you create or what kind of music teacher are you? What should they expect from you? And when are you going to be producing your videos? So again, it's that consistency thing. That's why you wanna immediately be able to tell your audience, I'm here every Wednesday, I'm here every Thursday, whatever your thing is. So I'm and looking then, at our banner right now. Should it say, uh, you know, videos released every Tuesday? Absolutely. Okay, we don't have that. that. I'm, I'm looking at it now. So, and then have you tested it to see how it looks on the different uh, devices? I believe we have, but I will. I haven't actually looked at it lately on the, on different device. So I'll have to do that. Brie has got a nice picture of herself. Um, it it could be even stronger if you popped yourself out of the picture and just had you against that purple background mm -hmm. that would create more space for your text. I like that you have your, um, your website, uh, you have the, you have the website, uh, you know, words URL. On, on it. Yeah. The URL yeah. not, but it's not clickable there. You might have a little arrow pointing to where it is clickable because Brie has sensibly added, this is something everybody can do. You can add clickable links to your channel banner. Brie has got Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and her website. So you can have a little arrow directing them to click on the website. And you could also give them a reason, a CTA. So mm -hmm. you just have your, your URL, but it's like, well, why, why do we care? What is it we're gonna get there? So you give us like a couple word, CTA pointing to the website. And then I'd be really interested to see these words on like my phone. It's kind of a lot of text in that chunk of text, amplifying musician right. voices. If there was a way to make it, you know, to make the text bigger and fewer words, but still get it all across, like, do you really need the since 2007? Probably yeah. not. <laughs> and then that would free up space for something like new videos every Tuesday, which could be centered in the middle, for example. Cool. Well, see, I'm loving this. This is my selfish reasons to have Fiona on here so I can get personalized tips on my channel. <laughs> so let me. By the time people see this, hopefully your channel will already have been changed. Ah, good point. Yes, because it will be a bit before um, between recording and when this is going to be on the podcast. So maybe uh, I'm also curious about the like channel. Let me interrupt in for just a second. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. In terms of advice for for your YouTube videos, right? When you turn this into podcast, this is a perfect example of where you could screenshot that banner and then have your editor insert it in the video so that we could, they could see what we were talking about. Then when you created your new banner and you screenshotted and you could screenshot that too and show the before and after, insert that into the video. 
more work. I can see your like, face. Wow, like, you're making work. a lot of work for me here. <laughs> but this is exactly how we make them more watchable and we increase our watch hours. Totally, totally agree with that. Um, the only other thing I wanted to ask real quick was on the um, like the channel video that, you know, the intro video. Yeah. We just recently redid ours. Do you recommend that people have that? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And you want to hit in that, in that intro video, you just want to hit, why should they follow you? Yeah. What, what, are, what are you about? Why, why are you here? Why should they be here? What's in it for them? And then that's always for the new people. Then what replaces that for people who come back and look in that area again, they'll see something else. So they'll see that the first time they come. And then you want to have a secondary video, which is really whatever other video you most want people to see. Or what I do is usually whatever is my most current video. Mm, okay. That's all. I actually didn't know that, that that changed for people that weren't there for the first time. Is, is that true? Like if you subscribe, is that the case? Or even if you don't subscribe, if you've been there before? Probably for subscribers. Okay. Uh, that's a good question that we could Google. Ah, that's true. <laughs> Thank you, Google. Okay. Any, I, this is like been a lot of information, so I don't want to overwhelm people, but is there anything else that you're like, oh my gosh, we have to talk about this? Well, we never, we never really talked about the covers for the, the indie musicians, the non-classical mm, singers. Okay. So we just want to hit that for a moment. I think that a lot of people, especially singer songwriters are kind of opposed to doing covers, right? They really want to put out their own new music. And this is great. We, we, I want to encourage everyone to put out your own new music, but you have to keep in mind for YouTube that nobody is searching your new music, except your Uber fans who already have found it, right? right. They're not the first people that you're trying to reach on YouTube. So you got to think about, okay, and again, it's kind of like reverse engineering. The kind of people who would like my music are also listening to what? Who are the biggest names in your genre that other people are, that, that people, if they, want, if they like that person, then they probably would like your music too. Then you, there's a couple different strategies you can take. Absolutely, when they release a new song or a new album, you do wanna cover it. So you wanna have a strategy in your, for your channel where maybe it's like two covers and two originals a month, right? Mm -hmm. so, you're, so you're putting out your new music, but you're also giving new eyeballs the opportunity to find you. When you put out those new covers, you absolutely want to make them your own, right? So a great thing is to do a uh, cross gender. So if they like this, you know, the opposite gender performer, they still would probably like my music. Why not? Why not create something completely original doing, doing a man's, doing a woman's version of a man's song or vice versa. Um, you can change. And another thing <laughs> that can be super fun is like taking someone that's not in your genre who's like super, super popular, like Taylor Swift or somebody, and, and then making it your genre. And, and like, what an interesting, strange mixture you might create. And then bring a lot of new eyeballs. Some of them, like with my firework app video, aren't gonna be people who are gonna be interested, right? Because they really only wanna hear that genre. But some of them are gonna be like, oh, you know, this is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Yeah, I'm the hugest fan of covers that are done in an interesting way. I used to have a whole show on it when I had the radio station because it's called We've Got It Covered and it was just the most amazing show ever. I loved it because it was, you know, just songs that you haven't thought about in forever, you know, maybe older songs or newer songs that are just like totally done differently and you're just surprised by each one of them. So I think that's super fun. I and think so in this should... case, it's who who is trending. You know, yes. we, don't, we don't like that trending thing necessarily, but it's, but you need to be aware what, what are people searching for? That's what, you know, that's what's trending. What are people actually searching for? But a, a, a pro tip is to, when somebody super big releases a new album, instead of doing the number one song, do the number two song. Mm. 
that is a pro tip because everyone's going to do the number one song or the number one song is going to be the lead single and everybody's just going to be paying attention to that video and not yours. Totally. Okay. I just realized one more thing I have to ask before we, cause this is important. It's about thumbnails because yes. thumbnails are so important on YouTube. And I think a lot of people don't realize how important they are because they're not thinking about a consumer on YouTube and what like draws your eye to make you click on a video. So what are a couple of the biggest tips you have on thumbnails? Yeah. So this is huge. And there's a whole section on thumbnails inside my YouTube domination course, because yeah, <laughs> um, what I, what I, sh what I do in the course is I show pictures of, of screen. I do a screenshot, like I do a search and I do a screenshot of what I find. And I say, which one would you click mm -hmm. on? <laughs> And that's, that's the way in is like search for something that you would search or, or a topic that you're going to create a video on and then look at what shows up and look, where does your eye go in terms of, of the thumbnails and in terms of the titles, both of them are <laughs> both the titles and the thumbnails are really, really important and people definitely underestimate it. And so some of the, the biggest tips for the thumbnails are simple, not a lot of text, text that is compelling, three to four words, super compelling text that makes you like notice it, visually appealing, preferably if you're, I mean, you're building your own brand. So usually there should be a, a photo of yourself, but that photo needs to be high quality and, and just not busy. The, the thumbnails are small, so they need to have a strong impact in a very small space. Yes, those are, those are some great tips for sure. And, and like you said, the branding is important. You want them to kind of look the same. So yes. people go, oh, that's, that's one of Bree's videos, you know? Yeah, exactly. Totally. And they can evolve over time. So you have, um, you know, the, you have several months or a year's worth of videos and the thumbnails are pretty similar. And then you move into some new branding and then you have another round. And, but again, it's like, you can really tell that this is still Brie. Right. But you're not stuck. You don't have to make the same thumbnail forever and ever. Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. But you do want consistent, again, the consistency. We're back to consistency again. So we've come full circle on the consistency thing for sure. Um, it's, it's, that's really where it's at with YouTube. You've got to keep producing content. Like she said, even if you can only commit to one video a month, at least you'll be producing content on a regular basis. So you can start building up what you've got there, what will bring people in and you know how you can get subscribers. So, oh my gosh, this has been so good. Of course, I probably had another million questions, but we can't get to them today. Um, if you have questions on YouTube, you guys, go check out Fiona, let them know where they can find you on social media. Absolutely. So Instagram is probably, I don't know. I want to say it's my primary, but it's now I'm, 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 I've diversified. <laughs> so definitely D, follow me and DM me over on Instagram. It's a great, a great place to communicate. I have a Facebook group called the profitable performer, and this is a, a wonderful place for more exclusive content. I have a YouTube channel, just search Fiona flight and you'll find me on YouTube where I, where you can hear my own music and where you can also get lots of um, videos on monetizing mind, mindset, marketing and monetization. That's what I cover on YouTube for performing artists, musicians, singers. And I have my two courses, my signature course, the Profitable Performer Revolution, which teaches all about building a profitable business as a performing artist, and my YouTube domination course, which is very much for beginners starting out on YouTube who really want to get started right and want that understanding of exactly what should that thumbnail thumbnail look like? What does that channel banner need to have included? And how do you rank in search? Because my videos do consistently rank in search as do my students inside YouTube domination. Awesome. Awesome. And for any of you just listening, Fiona Flight, F-L-Y-T-E, make sure you spell it right so you can find her. 
And I know she's very active on social. So definitely connect with her. And thank you so much, Fiona, for sharing all of this great info. I learned a few things today too, as usual. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.